All right, good afternoon, everyone. Once again, Mike Sarah from the league. Sorry about that. Just a little technical glitch. A um, few housekeeping items. Uh, Ciara uh, Bradley, who I mentioned, our research associate, uh, will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, you can put them into the chat. If we have some time at the end, uh, we, we might be able to open it up to, to the floor. Uh, I want to thank you for, for joining us to, 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 to this webinar. Uh, the Department of Labor, Wage, and Our Division will cover a range of updates in recent laws. Um, including an introduction to the new online certified payroll for public works projects, in addition to seasonal employees, minimum wage, uh, cop time, overtime, child labor, and, and earned sick leave, and whatever else may come up in the course of our conversation. Uh, so uh, we, we, again, we have our partners uh, from, from uh, DOL with us. We have uh, Commissioner Azaro Angelo. Uh, we have Assistant Commissioner Joe Petreca, um, Assistant Section Chief William Kiss, and Community Outreach Specialist, Nicole Jacoby. Yeah. So uh, without any further ado and to delay it, uh, Mr. Commissioner, thank you for joining us today. Much appreciated and um, always appreciate the, uh, the ongoing partnership between the department, the league, and uh, our member municipalities. So a good day to you, sir. And uh, the floor is yours, as they said. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, and, and thanks to you and the leadership of the city of municipalities uh, for having us and providing this opportunity for us. My only question is, where's the lunch? Is someone going to knock on my door and deliver it <laughs> at some point? But I'll, I'll start without it in the meantime. Uh, uh, you first didn't, of all, hello to all you. Didn't you get the door dash, not... Mr. Commissioner? Yeah, yeah that's great. That'd be great. Right. Um, uh, sorry, uh, 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 hello to everyone I haven't, I haven't met before. I'm a very proud son of a former council former council president in my hometown of East Brunswick, where I still live. Uh, so I know very well uh, the important roles. Uh, that you all play in your towns and i you know a lot of folks decry uh government uh in new jersey but i have a huge proponent of all the amazing work that we all do together uh and i really feel strongly that all of us are elevated all of us are stronger uh doing a better job of serving our constituents when we're working together better and that's what this is sort of all about um so thank you for joining us uh since the governor took office uh five and a half years ago we've had many positive developments that impact our workforce uh, which my colleagues will go into more detail in a little bit of how it affects you and your, the work you do every day. Uh, this year, minimum wage rose to $14.13 an hour as we continue on our track to $15 an hour by 2024. Our TDI and FLI insurance has expanded significantly in 21, and New Jersey continues to be one of the few states with generous earned sick leave laws. And contrary to popular belief, these benefits and protections have not caused the demise of our businesses, quite the opposite. We have the most employers and the most workers in our state's entire history. Uh, in the past five years, we've seen tremendous employment growth uh, across the state, employer growth, uh, including a 26% increase amongst our smallest businesses. That's including COVID time. 26% uh, increase in businesses with five employees or less. We're often held up as the reason why we shouldn't be moving forward with worker protections. Our labor participation rate is above 65% the highest we've seen in over a decade. Uh, I'm thankful for the very bipartisan support we've had from our legislators and we've continued to strengthen our state's public contracting laws, which much of today's presentation is about. Uh, we recently soft launched the New Jersey Wage Hub at njwages.nj.gov, where public works contractors and public bodies can submit and view certified payroll and public works projects. The Wage Hub will help us ensure public contractors are following fair wage practices under our prevailing wage laws, and also satisfy, satisfies reporting requirements under the Diane B. Allen Equal Pay Act. And in my mind, most importantly, it's hopefully going to take a lot of work off of all your plates. I know in the beginning it might be tough to get on in the first place, uh, but once this gets going, it's going to be a lot less work uh, in your hands or the hands of your or whoever else is dealing with this for your local body. Uh, not only are the state's policy strong, but the tools we've been given to enforce them have also been strengthened. We can now more, work more easily with other state agencies like taxation. We now have access to all their data. Uh, uh, for and tax information for research as well as investigations uh, to verify employers are following the law before they're permitted to receive state incentives or take part in any public works project. Uh, one of the most effective tools we've been granted is the authority to issue staff work orders against employers who are violating these laws. We've exercised this authority well over 100 times now, resulting in quick and positive changes for the workers and defending employers. Be clear, if I had my druthers, we would never have to issue a staff work order do why we're trying to educate our, our partners and public bodies across the state as much as we can, whether it be municipalities, school boards, 
county colleges, counties, higher ed, uh, whatever it may be, we're doing as much outreach as we possibly can uh, to avoid these problems from the start. I would, an overwhelming majority of our employers follow the law and do right by the workers. I'll be very clear about that. Uh, but so we're doing our best to weed out the bad actors uh, and also educate our employers on their obligations and work with them to operate under the law. So this isn't just about protecting workers or going after bad businesses. It's about protecting our business community uh, from being undercut by unfair competition from those who don't follow the law. Uh, we recently, um, I'm sorry, we're gonna have an easier time tracking and guiding our young workers now that we have a new online process for minors to get working papers. Uh, as of June 1st, young workers will get, the, get their working papers at myworkingpapers.nj.gov, myworkingpapers.nj.gov. Uh, if you're along the shore uh, and you're on the beach this weekend on Saturday, you'll see a, a, a plane flying a banner uh, with that ad on it about our new website. We're very excited about that. Uh, the process is now under our department instead of the 600 plus school districts around the state and done entirely online. Uh, this is part of a legislation signed by the governor last year that also expanded working hours for some teens while school is out of session. Uh, much like the wage hub you're gonna hear about today, uh, one of the main goals of this is to make this process easier for everybody. Uh, I know my team uh, who's 17, uh, has a car, has a great grades, is gonna go to a great college in the fall, somehow couldn't figure out this process by himself uh, when he had to get his paperwork from the school and go to the employer and go to the doctor and then get me to sign it. Uh, but he did very well after June 1st it was all in one, line, one online location. Um, so the website has career resources as well and information on young workers' rights and benefits. I know like me, you're probably hearing from your employers in town that they can't find workers. And this is a whole, our goal is to help this increase our talent pipeline right here at home in New Jersey. Uh, we've been working hard for, to prepare workers for a gainful career. So it's important we work together to take care of them once they get there and ensure fairness across the board. So we appreciate your role in making our state the best place to work and do business. Uh, thank you for very much for being here today. I hope you have an informative session. Uh, stay safe. Uh, have a great summer. And if I don't see you before, then look forward to seeing you at the conference uh, in November. Mike, thanks again for having us on today. Uh, we have a great team behind me to, uh, to talk about all the work that we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I appreciate your, your, uh, your joining us today. And uh, I'll take you up on that in, in, in Atlantic City in the conference. We'll follow up with you as well. Uh, with that, I'm going to leave it to your staff. Uh, I believe, Joe, are, are, are you up next? I am. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you also, Commissioner. It's good to see you. Good afternoon to all. Um, thank you very much, Mike, uh, Lori, uh, Sierra, all you, uh, your staff. We appreciate you very much uh, and partnering with us at the Department of Labor uh, for hosting this Lunch and Learn. Um, it's great to have everybody else on, on attending the session. And let me say, you know, we appreciate every one of you uh, and the work that you do on behalf of the public. Um, as mentioned, my name is Joe Kostecki. I'm the public entity liaison for the Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division. Uh, my job is to be a, a point of contact for all public agencies and foster agency relationship and provide guidance on public works pro projects, um, especially the employers who are now covered under the two 2019 law. Um, our talented speakers today have a task ahead of them with several topics to present. Uh, from the Wage and Hour Division, we have Section Chief William Kiss and Community Outreach Specialist Nicole, Nicole Jacoby. And then towards the end of our presentation, we are lucky enough to be joined with some excellent people of Ripple, uh, who are a talented nonprofit uh, company, uh, short for Research Improving People's Lives. And they will be providing a live demo on the Department of Labor's new online certified payroll dashboard. Uh, and in the demo, we will, will be able to show all the public agencies that you know, the, on this webinar, the way to register uh, and actionable items on the dashboard. So we're very ex excited about that as well. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to start the, have to allow me to uh, share the screen if you guys can. Oh no, that's what I'm thinking. That wasn't the one who was. He said the public. You speaker. should be able to, um, this is Sierra. You should be able to share now. Let's see. Okay. There you go. Thank you, Sierra. Appreciate you. Perfect. We're all set. Nicole, go ahead. You're all good, Joe. Thanks for the introduction, and thank you, Commissioner Tu, for your opening remarks. My name is Nicole Jacoby, and I'm the Community Outreach Specialist for the Wage and Hour Division, and I'm going to get us started off with our presentation. So, Joe, if you could move to the next slide, please. <laughs> yeah, I don't see it yet on my screen. Should I copy? Yes, we're good. 
Here we go. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so first we're going to start off with a quick disclaimer. Um, we just want to state that the presentation is intended as general information only and does not carry the force of legal opinion. And please note, as you know, as municipality officers, that laws and regulations can change quickly. Um, so this presentation is a snapshot of the current time of what the laws and regulations say. Um, so we just have to keep in mind that this is a, a temporary document, but you could use it as a reference too. And I know the League of Municipalities said that it's being recorded as well for your reference. Um, and the New Jersey statutes and administrative code should be consulted for the most specific advice on these issues. And for the wage and hour division, we're going to cover these topics today in our presentation. It'll start with seasonal employee and minimum wages, uh, then going into child labor, then going into comp time and overtime, and then earn sick leave, and then contractor registration, and then the new online certified payroll that will be demonstrated by the folks from Ripple. Um, so Joe, you can move to the next one. And our first slide here is the New Jersey minimum wage chart. And this was just updated at the beginning of this year. Uh, minimum wage changes each year on January 1st. Um, so just keep in mind, January 1st, that's when the minimum wage increases in New Jersey. And just to run through our um, row that talks about the current year, 2023, um, for most employers, the minimum wage is $14.13. For seasonal and small employers, which means small employers means fewer than six employees, um, the minimum wage for those that category would be $12.93. And then for agricultural employers, it would be $12.01. The cash wage for tipped workers is currently $5.26. And the wage for long term care facility direct care staff members is currently $17.13. And you might be run, wondering where that 13 cents came from. Traditionally, the minimum wage would just go up a dollar each year. And the 13 cents comes from the consumer price index, the CPI, which is based on inflation. Um, so to keep up with the cost of living, we had that extra 13 cent bump at the beginning of this year that was incorporated into the minimum wage. Um, so we have pictures of this chart on our website. You can print it out and uh, hang it up at your place of business. And it's a good reference tool. So we always recommend that employers have that. Next, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about one of those categories, which is the seasonal employer category. And seasonal employers, as we mentioned before, they have a slightly different minimum wage, which is $12.93 in 2023. And we define seasonal employers three ways. Um, so this is an either or situation. So you have to meet one of these three requirements to be a seasonal employer. Um, so the three ways are that, number one, you provide services only in a 10-week period during June, July, August, and September. Or number two, during the previous calendar year, at least two-thirds of the gross receipts that you've received in a continuous 16-week period. So still keeping in frame that, that time period to make it a seasonal employer. And the third option is that during the previous calendar year, at least 75% of wages were paid for work that was performed during a single calendar quarter. Um, so for seasonal employers, very important to keep in mind um, those months, June, July, August, and September, or that you receive two thirds of receipts in that 16 week period, a short time frame, or that 75% of wages were paid during a single calendar quarter. Um, this doesn't include labor on a farm, so we want to make that distinction. And just to reiterate again, the minimum wage is twenty is twelve dollars and ninety three cents per hour for seasonal employers in New Jersey this year. And we can move to the next slide, Joe. Thank you. Just click through because it's a graphic. Yep. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about child labor and some job opportunities for minors. And at eleven years old, minors can work in newspaper delivery. Twelve years old, they can work in agriculture. And then uh, 14 to 15 year olds, they can work in most general employment occupations, but there's a few restrictions. Um, so we wanna make sure that you know they're working safely. And for 16 year olds, they can work more hours and they have more choices in the occupations that they work in. So we'll move to the next slide. Yep, uh, work that minors can't do. So these are prohibited occupations depending on the age and the occupation. Um, wanna make sure just to start off that minors aren't working in any hazardous occupations. Um, so for cooking, minors cannot work in cooking until the age of 16, um, but they could work with um, electronic like fryers. Um, they can't work over an open flame. Um, so if they're working at a McDonald's, that, that could be a different case. Um, there are a few nuances in, in the cooking side of things, but just no open flames and nothing hazardous with cooking. 
um, can't work with power tools until the age of 16. Factory work can't work until age 16 either. Deli slicers could be dangerous, um, can't work with deli slicers until the age of 18. Trash compactors until 18 as well. Any work on roofs. Um, we want to just make a quick note here that um, roofing, a slight distinction with that would be a nonprofit like Habitat for Humanity. That would be okay, um, a nonprofit like Habitat for, for Humanity, but for the most part, no work on roofs for minors. Um, construction sites obviously can be dangerous as well. Um, that would have to wait until age 18. Any adult type entertainment until 18. Poisonous acids, dyes, or chemicals until 18 as well could be hazardous. Establishments serving alcohol until age 16. And lifeguards until age 15. And we actually covered this in our session last week on some seasonal occupations for minors. And for lifeguards, they can work at a private swim facility up to age 15, or starting at age 15, but they can't work on a public beach until they're 16. Um, so that's a slight distinction there with the lifeguards. They have to be 16 to work at a public beach. And now we're gonna talk about the new process for working papers. And the commissioner did a great job of outlining this new process and the benefits that it provides to be streamlined online. And the first step of this new process would be that teenagers and their employer would go to myworkingpapers.nj.gov to get started. And then next, employers would receive a unique eight-digit code when they register, which they share with every minor that they hire. And can we please mute some of the, the background noise? Yeah. Yes, please. If you're not speaking, can you please mute yourself? OK, I'm going to start from number one again. Um, teenagers and employers each go to myworkingpapers.nj.gov. Then employers receive a unique eight-digit code when they register, which they share with every minor they hire. We know the other one. And I'm oh, we know Let me see if I can try. Yeah. This is Let me see if yeah, I can I'll, try. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'm going to try to mute them for you. Just give me Thank you. But, you know, yeah, just so that everybody but, can hear, because this is important. Okay. It's always been done. Do you say? Just the front book. And then give me a copy, and then I'll tell you what to do with it. Oh, OK. You can um, unmute yep, yourself. I unmuted. You Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Not a problem. OK, so teenagers and employers go to myworkingpapers.nj.gov to begin the process. Then the employer would receive a unique eight-digit code when they register, which they would share with each minor that they look to hire. Then the minor would complete the online working papers application. They enter in their caregiver's name and email address and the employer's eight-digit code, which links the application to a specific employer. Then the emails would prompt the employer and the minor's caregiver to complete their portions of the application and sign off. And then last, the minor would begin working when their application is approved by NJDOL. So that's our new process. I can share some um, handouts that we have that describe this process as well in the chat. So we can move on to the next slide. OK, now we're going to talk about earned sick leave, which is the law in New Jersey. It's very important. Um, this is under NJ Statute 34, semicolon 11D-2. And under earned sick leave, we want to make sure that everyone knows that all full-time, part-time, and temporary workers are eligible for earned sick leave. And for earned sick leave, it doesn't matter how big the business is, every employer is responsible for providing earned sick leave. And one distinction I want to make specifically for um, municipalities is that one exception to earned sick leave is if employees are provided with, with earned sick leave pay, a PTO policy, under any other NJ law or rule, they could be exempted from this earned sick leave policy. Um, they just you just have to make sure that your municipality is already providing that um, for those workers. And yes, that is noted there. And if you have an existing sick leave policy for employees, it must meet and exceed the requirements of the law. Employees can use sick time to care for themselves or family members. And the definition of family is very broad and generous. It can be used to care for physical and mental illness or wellness care to cope with domestic or sexual violence, or to attend a meeting at the child's school. And the way this works is that employees can earn one hour of sick leave for every 30 hours that they work, and this would be up to a max of 40 hours per benefit year. Or the employer could provide their employees with 40 hours of earned sick leave up front each year. So it's an option that the employer has to either have it be the accrual method, one hour for every 30 hours worked, or the advancing method where they pay or they provide the 40 hours of earned sick leave up front at the beginning of the benefit year. And we can move on to the next slide, please, Joe. Thank you. And a few more earned sick leave requirements for employers. 
An employer can require seven days advance notice when an employee has planned to use earned sick leave, and this would be a foreseen uh, reason to use it, which could be something you plan in advance, like a doctor's appointment for wellness care. You know which day that's going to come up. Um, so you can, employers can ask employees to provide advance notice. Um, it's not required, but that could be part of an employer's policy, um, especially for the, uh, the wellness care, the doctor's appointments, foreseen needs. However, if an employee's need for earned sick leave cannot be planned, an employer can just require the employee to give notice as soon as is as practical. Um, so this would be a case of waking up with a fever. You, you weren't planning for it. It's something that just happens. You wake up and you're not feeling well and you need to call out of work. Um, so that would be providing notice. And employers can require reasonable documentation if an employee uses earned sick leave on three or more consecutive workdays or on certain dates specified by the employer. That could be a, a very high volume period that's um, specified by the employer, and there could be some restrictions on using earned sick leave in that period, as long as it's included in the employer's policy. And employers cannot retaliate against employees for requesting or using earned sick leave. This is very important. Earned sick leave is the law in New Jersey, and employers cannot be penalized for using that sick time that they've earned and that they have a right to. And you can learn more at our website at mysickdays.nj.gov. There's a great frequently asked questions page there, and it's got a lot of great information um, that you can use to learn more about the law. And from here, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Bill Kiss, and he's going to start talking about contractor registration. So, Bill, the floor is yours. I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much, Nicole. And uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, my name is William Kiss. I am a section chief in public contracts for Wage and Hour. Um, so, I'd like to start off uh, talking about contractor registration. Uh, give you a little uh, statute background. The Public Works Contractor Registration Act requires contractors to register with New Jersey Department of Labor and Workforce Development prior to bidding on or engaging in public works, basically meaning all contractors, the main, the prime contractors, before they give you their bid, they have to be registered um, through wage and hour uh, for public works. Um, can we go on to the next slide, please? Okay. Also, if the prime contractor lists a subcontractor in the bid, they must be registered at the time the bid is submitted. All other subcontractors must be registered at the time they are hired, the time that the subcontract agreement is signed. If a contractor bids on or is found working on a public works project without being registered, the penalty, the max for the first violation, uh, can be up to $2,500 and also uh, could result in a stop work order being issued. All right, next slide. Okay. New Jersey. Um, so, so we have a registered public works contractor list. Um, and how do I confirm contractor status? New Jersey DOL maintains a list of registered public works contractors on our website. The current list contains as more than 6,000 businesses and is searchable by name, address, registration date, and certificate number. For specific and current registration information status, you can contact Wage and Hour at our uh, website of pwcr at dol.nj.gov, or you can call 609-292-9464 Get one of our contractor registration customer service, and we're always here to help. Um, or you can also go online. We have a website. It's our, it's our New Jersey portal.com. LWD backslash PWCR. And contractors can also check the status of their application when they apply online. Next uh, slide, please. Okay. Ooh. And here's just like a basic background right here of our kind of like what, what it looks like on the website. You can search and probably what I would do is I would make uh, whatever you're going there, you know, when you go in there and you do a search, um, if you probably just put like a company name, um, it may not come up. You may want to be broader, like in the contractor's name that you list. So I'll give you some options. So I like, let's say it's ABC contracting. I don't know necessarily if I would just put ABC, maybe put if it has periods, you might want to do A point 
B, point C. Just be a little more broader. So if you are trying to look up a specific contractor to see if they're registered, um, you know, that's what I do. But if you already know the information, if you, you pretty much plug it in, um, everything will come up. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's, a, it's around 6,000 is what we have on our, uh, uh, currently on the website. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so let's just give a little overview of our contractor and subcontractor um, responsibilities. Contractors and subcontractors must, um, as I mentioned before, <laughs> register with the uh, Department of Labor and Workforce Development, uh, Wage and Hour Division. Contractors and subcontractors contractors are responsible for paying prevailing wage rates based upon work classifications for all hours. They can post a wage determination in a prominent place where workers have access. Also, if, it, if it's hard to put it at um, a job site, uh, most job sites or trailers allow for this wage determination, it should be posted, but it also could be at the place where the employee is also paid. So it could be either or, but most job sites should always have a wage determination. Um, contractors and subcontractors are responsible for submitting certified payroll records to the public body within 10 days of payment of wages. And also they're required to produce in-house payroll and other related documents to the Department of Labor within a reasonable time frame. Next slide, please. You know, so our, you know, our main statute here for the New Jersey Prevailing Wage Act, um, which is under n.j.sa34, 11-56.25, it's, it's our public policy. Um, it is declared to be the public policy of the state to establish a prevailing wage level for workmen engaged in public works in order to safeguard their efficiency and general well-being. This law is also meant to protect them as well as their employers from the effects of serious and unfair competition resulting from Wage levels detrimental to efficiency and well-being. You know, to put that law simply, and, and, and it's a great law, it's out there to protect everybody. It makes everybody equal for all contractors, creates that equal level playing field that, you know, if you're an employee, that's what you want when you work on a prevailing wage project. You want to know you're being traded fairly, and that's what this law does. So give you a little overview. The public contract section of wage and hour division regulates the payment of prevailing wage rates on a public works project through number one, the distribution of a prevailing wage rate determination for each trade, craft, and classification, and um, for building rates that is done by county, and obviously for our highway in general, um, you know, for our highway in general type work, there's actually state mandated prevailing wage rate determinations for that. Number two, the implementation of fines and penalties to employers. Three, the barment from bidding or working on a public works project for three years for contractors determined to be serious offenders. And then we also have the stop work orders, which immediately can halt work at any public or private work private work site, both construction and non-construction sites, when the initial investigation finds evidence that the employer has, <coughs> excuse me, has violated any state wage, benefit, or tax laws. Next slide, please. So some additional responsibilities. Public work contracts must contain language advising of the Prevailing Wage Act and the Public Works Contractor Registration Act. When the public body receives a bid for a contract which is 10% or more lower than the next lowest bid, the lowest bid bidder must submit a written certification to the public body prior to awarding the contract and certifying the prevailing wage rate. Note, if the contractor does not provide this required certification, then the public body must award the contract to the next lowest responsible and responsive bidder. Certified payrolls, which by the way, <clears throat> the certified payroll is on our website. 
a few years ago, the law was passed out. We have a mandated form and contractors must submit the certified payroll to the public body for every pay period worked and will soon be required to do so electronically, which is gonna be, be discussed uh, in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and they must be submitted them to a general contractor just to, you know so basically a contractor or sub well actually this will be a subcontractor just submitting them to a general contractor does not satisfy the legal requirements they have to be submitted to the public body within the time frame um, that was just mentioned next slide okay so now <clears throat> what the administrative code talks about the new jersey administrative code the public works contractor and subcontractor shall submit to the public body or lessor, which contracted for the public works project, the following in a form satisfactory to the commissioner. One, it is a certified payroll record on each public works project. The certified payroll is pretty much, it's, it's a form that you know, will list the contractor or subcontractor's name, address, employees' names will be listed on this form, work craft, the week ending dates, the daily work hours, the overtime, gross net project, anything that has to do with benefits. These are all things that a contractor and subcontractor puts on the certified payroll. Okay, They are required for this record. It shall be submitted, like I said, uh, within 10 days of the payment of wages. And then it is the public body's responsibility to receive, file, store, and make, avail and make available for inspection during normal, <clears throat> at its normal place of business and during normal business hours. That's where the certified perils get submitted. And has to be, you know, there are normal business hours. And investigators of uh, wage and hour, uh, just, just for the certified perils, um, when we go in during normal business hours, they have to be made ready, available. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, I think that concludes my part of the, uh, um, and uh, just want to say again, um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk today. Um, and even though it's not in the slide, um, um, anybody can always feel free to always email me or call me. If you ever have any questions, I'm always here to help. And, uh, you know, anything, anything you guys need, I'm, I'm here for. Thank you. Um this is Sierra. Is it possible? I had one question. Um, someone wanted to know if they can get a copy of this slide. <laughs> Joe, I think you're muted. Sure, it's absolutely possible. We'll do it. Yeah, it's being recorded oh. too as well. There we go. Okay. <laughs> So thank you very much, Bill. We appreciate you. Um, so part of the Department of Labor's uh, continuing effort to modernize their operations, the department partnered with a technology uh, nonprofit to establish an, an online certified payroll uh, database. And this database uh, company is uh, for social impact, and it's called Ripple, uh, otherwise uh, known as Research Improving People's Lives. And uh, Ripple works with governments to help them use data, science, and technology to improve people's lives and uh, policy. So we're fortunate enough to have uh, Emily and Kate uh, to present this this new online uh, certified payroll system called the Hub. So um, Emily and Kate, the floor is yours. Let me know if you want to want me to stop sharing the screen. If you want to take over, if you want me to have one or two screens, just let me know. Um, Joe, if you want to go ahead, you have our slides. So if you want to go ahead and keep sharing your slide deck. We can run through the slides and then switch over to Kate to screen share the demo. Great, thanks Joe. Um, well, really appreciate you including us in this meeting today. Thanks to the League of Municipalities for having us and um, for the New Jersey Department of Labor for being such great partners in this work. Um, I did wanna say that our CEO, Scott Jensen and director of um, solutions, Abby and McQuaid are, are also on the line. So thanks for joining. I'm Emily Raffle. I'm the principal solutions lead at Ripple. And uh, like Joe said, we've been working with the New Jersey Department of Labor to 
bring these modern tools to life to um, support the enforcement of uh, prevailing wage and submission of certified payroll. So our plan today is to show you what that actually looks like in the flesh. Um, Joe already did a great job introducing who Ripple is, um, but just to reiterate, we are a tech for social good nonprofit. We bring policy, technology, and science together to work with um, state governments to do just what the commissioner said, to bring modern tools to support policy and implementation of practice to state governments. So if you go to the next slide, um, before we dive into the demo, we just wanted to give you a little bit of context around what we have been working with uh, the Department of Labor in New Jersey to do. So our initial goals when working together um, and that the, the um, partners that we've been working with in New Jersey have um, asked us to accomplish is to bring cloud technology to create an application where public works contractors across the state can digitally submit their certified payrolls um, so that it's easily searchable, uh, can be analyzed and reported on and made available to the state uh, for its re enforcement responsibilities and also to other stakeholders. So really to streamline and digitize the process of certified payroll submission, not just for the state agency, but also for all of you, for public bodies um, and other stakeholders. And then because all of the, the information submitted through this application um, is now in formats that are more easily searchable and analyzed, um, to build in some analytical and reporting protocols for that strategic enforcement and also to provide greater transparency to the public. Um, so to make this information more readily available. If you go to the next slide. We are going to show you uh, what it looks like for public bodies, but I did just want to sort of share what the whole application includes, which is portals for different users. Um, so for you all, for public bodies, you'll be able to upload information about your contracts and projects um, that fall under the umbrella of public works, and also to view certified payroll that is submitted for those projects. Um, the contractors, which includes both prime and subcontractors, will be able to submit their certified payroll for all of the projects that they're working on. Um, and all of that information will uh, be available for the New Jersey Department of Labor in an internal portal that gives them a bird's eye view of data and analytics for enforcement. Um, and we are also currently working on, so this will be launched in the next um, couple of months, a uh, what we are currently calling a public portal, we're going to come up with a better name for it, but a way for the general public to um, search and find information that has been approved to be made public. So it won't include all of the publicly identifiable or personally identifiable information that's submitted through certified payrolls, but it will help make this information more accessible and transparent to the general public. So the overall goal really is to help uh, make it easy for everybody in this process, for you and for your contractors to comply with these set of laws and regulations. Um, and for you in particular, to make it easier for uh, you to organize and maintain the certified payrolls that are submitted to you, and also to give the Department of Labor access to that information without them having to knock on your door. Um, and same goes for any OPA request that you might um, that you might receive. If you go to the next slide. Just really quickly, um, don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I want uh, to make sure you have time to see the actual tool. Um, but we've been working with the Department of Labor um, on this since September, and our process is really agile um, and user centered. So we have done a lot of user testing and worked with contractors and public bodies to make sure that these tools are as user friendly as possible. And we've soft launched this and um, starting in early May, we have some public bodies and contractors already using the system. And we're getting ready for the sort of wide release um, in the next week or two. Uh, although anybody who's on the, on the line can start using it now if you want. 
Um, and we are continuing to iteratively develop the tool. So we are definitely open to questions and feedback um, as you start using it. Next slide. Um, and I will, yeah, turn it over to Kate to show you what the application actually looks like. Hi, hey, everybody. I'm going to share my screen for just one sec. Um, hey everybody, I'm Kate Ulinski. I'm the product lead on the New Jersey Wage Hub. Um, I'm gonna give you a little tour of what this tool will look like from your perspective. Um, I'm on a single screen, so feel free to interrupt me. I can't see you if you're making a questioning face or drop something in the chat, but feel free to stop me in the middle. Another quick thing I wanna mention is that we're using a QA environment. So that address you're seeing in the URL bar, that's not the correct URL. You'll get that at the end of the presentation and there may be a few peccadillos or weird pieces of content floating around here and you can attribute most of those hopefully to the fact that it's a QA environment. So as we were building this thing with our partners at the DOL, we really wanted to keep in front of us, especially for all of you and other public bodies the need that William described and Emily also touched on, which was to collect, organize, and make all of the certified payrolls on the public works project you're operating available, as well as to make those seamlessly available to the DOL. So when you go to the correct URL, you'll come to this page, and there are a couple different groups of users who Emily also touched on who will be using this. This is you guys over here with the contractors, subcontractors, and public bodies. You'll log in with your My New Jersey account. Then you'll get to a page that looks like this, where you'll be asked to choose your role. You'll be the public body and contracting agency. From there, we'll ask for a couple of details for onboarding, uh, including the FEIN of your agency. And once you log in, for now will be the Riverdale Public Library, you're gonna see a page that looks like this. And you're gonna see projects. Each of these cards is a project or a contract that was added by a prime contractor or was added by you. And I'll show you what it looks like to add a project here. It looks like I'm gonna have to log out though again. So one minute, excuse me. We're back in action. So when you go to add a project, we're gonna ask for some basic details of the project, hopefully things that you have easily and are readily accessible, the project name, the contract ID, the contractor project ID, the award date is particularly critical because we are gonna tie that, we hopefully will tie that in at a later stage to the wage determinations, the award amount, the status of the project, most likely active when you put it in, what type of project we're doing, if it's maintenance or construction, where the project is taking place, and also the prime contractor's information. Optionally, also you can upload all or part of a scanned project as a PDF or a PNG or a JPEG, whatever you like. Once the project exists, it will appear like these others as a card. And something you can do is to share that project either with other colleagues in your agency or perhaps to share it directly with the prime contractor themselves to let them know um, that they've been added to a project. And I'll show you what that email looks like in just a minute. But you can add up to 30 of them here so you can keep going indefinitely and almost indefinitely and all of these people will receive an email that they've been named as a stakeholder in this project on this site. And they'll contain, the email will contain instructions about how to log in or register. So I'll share that and that email will. So now that you've shared your project with your prime contractor and your prime contractor will even share that project probably with subcontractors, 
they can start adding certified payroll to the project. And when they do, this gets to the heart again of what William described, which is your role, which is to collect and make this information available in the event of an investigation. So all the certified payroll submitted for this project from all contractors will be shown in a table like this. You'll see the contractor name, their registration and debarment statuses at the time the certified payroll was submitted. So theoretically that could change week over week or that we hope everybody is in good standing and there are no hiccups there. Their role, if they're the prime or the subcontractor, state those wages were due and paid if that's information they gave us on the certified payroll form, what week ending date it's for, Okay, and you can easily sort any of these columns. So hopefully that'll help any gaps jump out at you if you're looking to check on that before you issue payroll, for example. And when we receive the certified payroll um, to the New Jersey Wage Hub. So for each of these certified payrolls, you can drill down further and you can see the details of the certified payroll. Um, I will say, I think it was mentioned earlier that uh, there is a specific form to be used for this. It's called the MW562. Um, we can definitely uh, share a link, but this form that you see on the Wage Hub is the same content in the MW562. We've tried to make it a little easier for contractors to submit it uh, by pre-filling what information we can and also giving them different options to submit the certified payroll. There are four in total. So one is they will just come to the New Jersey Wage Hub and they will type in all the information for the employees worked, the employees and um, the hours worked and their deductions. Add the fringe benefits. And the certification details. Another option that we uh, enable users to do is to copy, uh, to duplicate and edit previous week's submissions. So if you're working with, the, if a contractor is working with the same crew and has a similar makeup, wants to base their submission on a previous week, we allow them to then copy and modify that before submitting it for a new week ending date. We also allow users to submit the 562 itself. We can upload it to the system and read it and then display it within the application itself. And we also provide a CSV template. And it doesn't matter which way this information is submitted on the contractor side, both for you and for the Department of Labor, you'll see it in the same form, which is what we're looking at right now, and also have access to that information in exactly the same way, no matter how it got here. Any questions about that before I go on? Okay, within each certified payroll, you'll also be able to download a copy, which will pop up for me in a sec. Great. Okay, and the downloaded copy is structured in the same way as the form itself. It's divided into four different steps, four different steps and four different tabs. So you get the company details in the first tab, a list of those employees, their hours worked and deduction in the second tab, all of the fringe benefits in the third tab, and the certification details in the last tab there. So as contractors add certified payroll to the project, you will continue to get more rows that look like this and contain all the details of the certified payroll so that you're getting an ongoing digital record of all of the certified payroll submitted on the project. And just to circle back to that email, uh, once you share a project, this is what goes out um, to any of the recipients. They'll be notified that they have a new project with all the details of the project. We'll give them the correct URL of where to sign up and instructions for what to do if you're a contractor or a contracting agency.
great. Um, I think that concludes my brief overview of things, but I'm happy to answer questions um, or take additional comments or clarifications that Emily or Scott or Abby want to add to what I've said. Thank you very much, Emily and Kate. We appreciate you. Uh, thanks for introducing this. This is a, a great step uh, on behalf of the, uh, the cooperation between you and the Department of Labor. So uh, we're looking forward to this, this large outreach aspect and uh, initiation. So um, thank you very much. Um, we're going to bring it back to uh, Mr. Sarah. If, uh, if there are any questions, please open up the floor. Sure. Thank you, Joe. Excellent presentation, everyone. Thank you. Very, very informative. And um, I'm gonna. I, I've seen some um, inform, uh, some, some links dropped in the chat uh, from Nicole, from Emily, uh, and, and some some others. Uh, Sierra, do you have any questions in the in the chat? I do not have any questions. The only question I did receive uh, was regarding uh, getting a copy of the slide. I guess people want to use that for their own purposes with their own offices. I know that this is recorded, but we can get a copy of that so we can put it on our website. Uh, we would appreciate that. Does anyone else have any questions in the chat? You want to give them a couple minutes? Oh, well, we can open it up too. If any, if, uh, if if anyone doesn't like to type and uh, want, wants to unmute themselves and have a question, you feel free. Otherwise, I'm going to take it that the presentations were so thorough and 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 excellent that all the possible questions were answered. So, um, folks, uh, keep an eye out for the link. We'll we'll send it out to everyone so the, you can go back to the recording. It will be posted on our website if not this afternoon by tomorrow morning. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get the uh, the slide deck posted as well. Um, thank you to the commissioner. I don't know if he was able to stay on, but uh, all the staff at DOL from Ripple and everyone else, uh, much appreciated. Um, Mike, there is, I'm sorry, real, real fast. There was a, a question with regard to uh, OPRA obligations. So um, the, okay. the, with regard to the certified payroll, um, the, all of the, the private bodies must still submit their certified payrolls online. Um, it, it, uh, to, in order to fulfill their OPRA obligations, they still have to submit those certified payrolls to the public body. Um, uh, based on how this, this goes, that, that should uh, solidify their obligations for OPRA as well. So I just wanna make sure that that's clear. If there's any, any other nuances, uh, anybody else, please, uh, please feel, feel free to, to step in. I would just add, Joe, that it's likely the public municipalities will get less OPRA requests once the system is in place because there will be a public portal and the public will have access to the certified payroll. So the need, we're hoping even in the Department of Labor, the need for OPRA requests to look at certified payrolls will drop dramatically over time. Which will be highly beneficial to all my fellow clerks out there. I appreciate you, all the RMCs and CMCs. <laughs> That's true. MMC, all of you. All right. We appreciate you. So this will help make your job easier, hopefully, as well as uh, make it easier for the uh, the, the private entities as well to submit so you can submit them at any time. So this is a very pro business um, initiative. So hopefully uh, this will be and even, uh, if, even if you do. Even if you do get a request, it's a lot easier to retrieve them. Their catalog is one, two, three. You can go into the system, get whatever uh certified payrolls you want or need to pursue or to answer the OPA request so either way whether you get one or not it's beneficial but I presume we're going to get a lot fewer OPA requests as time goes on thank you sir you're most welcomed all right uh any other questions then once again thank you everyone and uh this will be posted soon and I wish you all a, a great day and uh and in advance, a great 4th of July and, and, and hopefully a dry weekend. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Well, everybody. Take care. Thanks, everybody. And have a great 4th. And thanks for having me.